obviously you teach Hindi to your students at Harvard. Mm -hmm. So what do you think is the hardest part about teaching? That's a very good question. The hardest part of teaching language is um, the disconnect between what I understand the world of language to be and perhaps um, where the students are coming from. Okay. So the students have a particular understanding of what it means to learn a second language mm -hmm. and, um, and they have expectations and they want to do it um, you know, as quickly as possible. Right. And I can see that it's a long, arduous and you know, not always, it's a laborious um, mm -hmm. sort of journey to some degree and I can see that it takes a long time and that you have to have patience. patience. And it's managing that that's really, everything else is fine. You know, the students, no matter where I've taught, um, have always been excellent. Uh, and they've always been keen and excited. It's just managing their expectations that, look, this does require a certain amount of um, just basic, um, you know, fundamental work mm -hmm. that you have to do. And you can't expect to be able to sort of articulate yourself in a manner that you feel as an adult you should be able to mm -hmm. immediately. It right. takes time, it takes a long time. And uh, I often like to say to my students that look, in two years of classroom instruction, you have roughly maybe 240 hours of, um, of um, classroom instruction, which means exposure to the language in the target language. And it's not even that much because you use English in mm -hmm. the classroom as well. But it really takes a ballpark figure, might be 5,000 hours mm -hmm. of immersion to actually get to a point where you can really use a language with some comfort right. and a degree of comfort and uh, facility. And 4,700 of those hours are in country. Right. They have to be in country. Yes. And so it's always about managing those expectations okay. and helping students to see that, look, it's their task now to put in place a, a strong um, structural understanding of the language so they can go on and do whatever they want with it. What do you see students doing um, after they complete their degree? Uh, often uh, our students uh, go on and spend time in India or okay. Pakistan and um, some of them come from a background which you know, enables that a little bit mm. more easily and um, they do internships there or they okay. go on language study programs. The, um, American Institute for Indian Studies okay. runs language programs in India. Sometimes they uh, then go on to work uh, in the government and mm -hmm. uh, also uh, the bureaucracy or um, the State Department or things of that nature. And um, increasingly students, India is attracting more and more people uh, for employment opportunities because um, things are developing rapidly there. Mm -hmm. So you know, you've got new, new universities where um, people are being paid more mm -hmm. and so I've, uh, one of my students um, uh, recently got a job at one of the newer private universities in Delhi and things oh, like that. So cool. he, there are more and more opportunities for people to actually go there and, and meaningfully engage in their professional life right. in India, I think. Yeah, yeah. So. very cool. Um, so you kind of already talked about this, but I really want to hear your opinion. Um, what do you believe is the value in teaching those commonly taught languages in the States? Well, I think the, the greatest value that one can uh, derive from this is that in a world where we believe that things are shrinking to a certain mm. degree and that technology brings the world to you, and particularly in the form of you know, devices and whatever, right. and um, smartphones <laughs> uh, and all these sort of things, um, the value of this uh, is one that uh, really sort of asks us or demands that we slow things down a little bit. Okay. and that we also uh, understand that our sense of what the world is has become actually more fragmented and fractured. And also, particularly with things like social media, I, f mm. I feel that, um, and many people have said this, many put more uh, people who are much uh, more intelligent than I am, that uh, in a sense it becomes something where your perspective can become narrowed by the fact that you're only talking to the same people and okay. you're only you're only sort of circulating in the same right. groups and things like that and so it's self-affirming in a way of the attitudes that you already hold it doesn't necessarily have to challenge you mm -hmm. in any um, meaningful manner and so and yet at the same time you feel like you've actually broadened your horizons you have expanded your horizons and so I really do feel that the greatest value of learning a second language for me at least is the idea that it's challenged me to think about who I am as a person okay. and why that's so important to me to hold on to that and, and maybe letting go of that a little bit and, and in a sense not making it so much about me, if yeah. that's possible, yeah. <laughs> so, which is very difficult yeah. to, to yeah. live in. But, um, but I do think that if you can help people to see that 
actually the world is still out there, it's still real and it's still very variegated and messy and complex mm -hmm. and convoluted, social reality is convoluted and you can't really get any true sense of that from having it come to you, sitting in your living room or something right, like right, that. Right. You have to go out there. And find it. Yeah, and find it. And so learning a second language actually um, inspires people to want to go out there mm -hmm. and to discover that world a little bit more, I yeah. think. Yeah. yeah, very cool. How old were you when you first learned Hindi? <laughs> well, I, I was, uh, I think, 20 or 21. Okay. Yeah. Was it very challenging for you, or what was your experience with that like? Well, I'm being totally honest. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> uh, I, the first time I went to university, I took a little bit of time off, and I was studying Hindi then as well, and it wasn't as meaningful. You okay. know? And so I, I wasn't particularly uh, adept at it. <laughs> That's doing okay. the work. <laughs> And, but then when I went back, I traveled to India uh, once and I'd also already been in Sri Lanka in high mm. school. And that's when I thought, this is just what I need to do. Okay. Like, I have to do it. Yeah. And um, so it, it wasn't difficult because, uh, because uh, no language is actually difficult. I know linguists might disagree with yeah. that, but human beings naturally are hardwired to learn language. So, and again, I tell my students that you actually have to stop yourself from learning. So, because the fact is that naturally, and particularly when you're younger, you, you integrate things, mm -hmm. and you integrate right. language, right. and it's about socialization. So you really have to, all you need is the desire, and right. I don't think it's a particularly difficult task. And Hindi Urdu, they're not very difficult either. Yes. <laughs> Maybe you're a little bit biased. <laughs> Possibly. Um. Yeah, I completely agree. I think with anything in life, all you need is passion and drive. And yeah. It happens, so. Yeah. I mean, the rest takes care of itself. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. Sorry, I'm kind of no, no, on track that's fine. a little bit. Um, so I read your abstract on your dissertation of politics, pleasure, and cultural production writing about Hindi fiction and post liberalization South Asia. That's an awful. Wonderful. <laughs> um, and so you mentioned your analysis of literary responses, and I think that's mostly what your research is um, mostly directed towards. Mm. Um, and you wrote this line that I really liked about the relationship between language and community. And so I kind of wanted to take that a step further and talk about um, what is that relationship between literary fiction and the community and language, and how does it all tie together? Mm. That's a very <laughs> good question, because um, I think about this a lot and, okay. you know, I'm still in the process right. a few okay. years down the track of <laughs> trying to turn that into a book and things like this. But um, uh, the fact is that we look at language in so many different ways, but uh, fiction and one person's attempt to understand their world through fiction, through the um, medium of writing or whatever, is something that we can grapple with. It's, it's individual on mm -hmm. the one hand, and yet it is part of, you're trying to reach a, a society or a community or a readership or whatever it is. And so you can see through, what really attracts me to fiction is that, um, in a meaningful way, is that you can see how a person is both trying to articulate their understanding of the world, but they have to do it in a conventionalized manner, and they have to do it in terms of um, uh, understandable terms to, to a potential readership. Mm -hmm. So you're always, you know, it's, it's a dialogical process in a way, and you're always trying to reach a person with what you want to write, right. while at the same time the very um, act of writing fiction is one where uh, you have to sort of think in, in a very serious and deep way about the world you live in. So in order to form your fiction, in order to uh, express your ideas, you have to, it's an artistic experience mm -hmm. that you're having. And so I really like that uh, idea that you can see there that there's an engagement. There's mm -hmm. an engagement with a potential readership, whether people do read them or not is another issue. But, um, but what I've liked about that is that uh, a novel or uh, short stories, but particularly, I find novels more interesting because um, over the course of a novel, the writer has to do so many things to create, to craft a story. Mm -hmm. And it's in those things that um, are sometimes done almost self, uh, unselfconsciously right. that the reader can sort of look at that and say, there are things here, there are tensions here, there are things that really are being forced upon the writer um, because of the need to communicate this to right. a particular public. And so whether it's um, the, the narrative itself or the characters or you know the context within which you um, place your characters and all those sort of things. So, 
I've always um, liked that engagement, and mm. there's a certain politics to it as well in terms of why you would even write in a quote unquote vernacular language, and some people don't like the term vernacular, um, as opposed to English in India. And so, because you don't have to write if you don't want to, and, right. and people would privilege English to some degree in English language fiction. So why a person chooses to write in Hindi uh, to begin with is, is a very, to me it's a fascinating idea. And that's why those books, for me, seem to contain a lot more, given my biases <laughs> and background, because I think, well, well, why are you picking up your pen and doing this in the first place? And so there's a lot, there's a richness there, there to mm -hmm. that. And because it takes time to craft something like that, and it's often 300, 400 pages long, it means that uh, there's so much to be gained from that. Mm -hmm. It's hard to articulate what a writer has gone through in that process through, throughout that whole sort of work of fiction. And it's hard to capture that, but it's interesting if you can attempt to. Yeah. So I really, yeah, I really like that. And then you see that um, it's all Hindi, uh, different writers, but they all have different styles. They're writing from different locations, so um, uh, one of the things I was working on was a comparison of three novels right. which are written, um, one was written in, the writer is in Delhi but he's a much younger writer and uh, the book is set in Jaipur and it's really about an aspirational class. One is um, um, perhaps one of the most celebrated Dalit writers in India uh, who also mm -hmm. lives in Delhi and his first novel and then the third one is a novel or what is called a novel, but that's probably a um, misnomer, that's set in Banaras and um, is the earliest of the three of them. So that's a little bit more of a, if I could use the word, conventional Hindi mm -hmm. sort of text, whereas the other two are really trying to take things in different directions. So, But the, the language of all three of them is very different, the locations are different, the mm -hmm. narratives are different, what they focus on is different, to the point where, yes, they're all Hindi, but um, how far that, that, that category has to be stretched mm. to understand you know, what we're talking about when we lump them all together as you know, the literature of one language. Okay. You know, so yeah. I find all of that kind of fascinating when I get time to do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so did you find any, I'm sure it's in your dissertation that I could not have access to, but did you find any similarities at all between those three? Other than those uh, those uh, uh, particular novels are, are very different okay. yeah, in many ways um, and necessarily different because their worldview is very different. Okay. The, the yeah. three writers, their worldview is very different. But I do find over the... you do find some trends over the 90s mm -hmm. in a way. So the 90s in Hindi fiction, um, there were more Dalit writers who were writing in Hindi and trying to carve out a space for themselves um, and then also um, uh, some female writers who became um, quite prominent in the 1990s, one of whom is Metre Pushpa, who writes about uh, Jharkhand, uh, not Jharkhand, um, Bundelkhand, that sort of region, um, uh, Aligarh around that region, and writes about uh, village life for women uh, cool. in, I think, the seven or eight or even nine novels that she's written. And then you have writers like Gitanjali Sri, who has written maybe four or five, her latest novels just come out, uh, novels where her whole training originally was in English and she came to write uh, Hindi fiction in the late 80s I think as a way of s sort of saying hey this is who I am mm -hmm. and really my, my um, first language is or should be Hindi not English and it's the language that I choose to uh, sort of s represent as my inner language mm -hmm. in a way or of my inner subjectivity and so for her it's, her novels are very different again because they're trying to, uh, in some way, hold on to that or capture that, or you know, a person who's had most of their and a high level of education, having done a PhD mm -hmm. and in history and um, all these sort of things, who says this is something that I feel um, creatively I need to develop yeah. and and express myself yeah. through Hindi rather than English. So again, I mean, those sort of things are fa how you get a purchase on them and how you actually. Um, think through those uh, tensions and ideas is kind of quite difficult. Yeah. I found it quite difficult, but it's stimulating to think, you know, all these different people who are saying, I want to write in Hindi mm -hmm. and I want to do it for these reasons that are important to me. So it's a very personal thing. Yeah. So the language is a very personal thing in a way. And I, find that I found that very um, interesting.
So you mostly focus on the motivations behind? Well, it's hard to um, impute motivation in a way. Uh, you can only kind of um, deal with the text itself okay. and say, well, you know, how does a text like this come about? So, okay. so it's not um, it's not fair for me to sort of um, impute why a person may write in the right. language, um, but or may write the particular text that they do. But uh, it's ha it's also mm -hmm. hard to um, separate the author out completely, right. in a sense. So it's more about um, well. Uh, Maybe there's an intentionality there on the part of the author, but what's what is actually the finished product? What what okay. what actually comes about gotcha. when intentionality meets, you know, having to write something in a particular context for a, a, some sort of notional readership? Gotcha. So that's kind of where I try to work. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, do you ever think that you're going to do an analysis between male writers and female writers? That mm, that's uh, that's a hard question to answer in a way because, in a sense, um, the gender uh, is important. Mm -hmm. Yes, of uh, um, of the writer, and I do think that in the '90s, in particular, um, some more uh, female writers became m much more prominent. Which is not to say there weren't uh, novelists uh, in earlier times who were female mm -hmm. and whatever. But I do think that. Uh, you know that these sort of things need more attention, yes. uh, and and it's um, it's hard exactly. I mean, we live in an age now where uh, gender is sort of a construct or a category that we think seriously about mm -hmm. and, and deeply about, and so um, in both America and increasingly in India. So yeah, I think it is important to sort of look at them uh, and say, well, uh, when a woman chooses to write about her community or her life or something like that. And um, what, what's, how is that proceeding? How does that mm. unfold, in a way? So, in the case of Metre Pushpa, it's very clearly about women and the village right. and uh, how women have um, the struggles that they've had in village India in the, you know, from the 80s and 90s onwards. Mm -hmm. And in fact, but the interesting thing about um, her novels to some degree is that she ha had been in Delhi, I think, for almost 30 years before she started writing about the village. Well, and so in a way yeah. it's kind of, there's a certain nostalgia there as well, yeah. perhaps, for a world that uh, is being lost mm -hmm. and, and village India is being transformed radically. I think. So yeah, so gender is uh, an important part of it and it is important to see like what sort of concerns a writer has and whether you can sort of suggest that maybe part of that has to do with their personal background. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. Mm. Very cool. I also think the more distance that you have from something, the more you can reflect on that mm. um, within you know duration of time. So it's really you can reflect that. on it, uh, but at the same time, it changes your reflection. Perspection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can't help but see it um, in you know, terms that are sort of where the memories sort of are more uh, well. They're, they're, they're more prominent in a particular way. Okay. So when you're living through an experience, um, that's one way of sort of, sort of coming to terms with it. But when you're reflecting on it later on, mm -hmm. it depends on the individual, I'm sure. But when you're reflecting on it, um, those reflections are necessarily influenced by where you're at in the present. Okay. Again, yeah. so why you would, when you're in Delhi in the early 90s, why you would choose to start writing about rural India? Why, why not about sort of Delhi right. and your life in Delhi right. or women's lives in Delhi or mm -hmm. something like that? So. They're the sort of questions. It's not not always easy to come up with um, categorical or or definitive answers to these questions. But they're the questions that kind of <coughs> motivate me when I'm when I approach a text like that. Mm. So, the, how does this text come about? Right. Why is it about what it's about? <laughs> right. And it's speculative to some degree, but as long as um, you treat the text with respect and the writer with respect, because at the end of it all. The most important thing is that someone has laboured over this right. and has spent a lot of time and energy and thought and wanted to communicate something. Mm -hmm. Like there's a, there's a yearning there on the part of the author to communicate something. So you have to respect that mm -hmm. as um, you know, their labours um, and that they've tried to meaningfully make sense of their world. That's the most important thing for me. Yeah. So. Very cool. Um, what else would I like to ask you? Um, so, a part of your lecture today is going to be on Bollywood films, I believe? Maybe not as much. But maybe not, <laughs> but yes. you'll touch on it a little bit, maybe? Possibly. Okay. Um, so, I, with that 
um, in mind. How did the role of cinema and other platforms of art emerge in India, and what is that significance mm. in our world today? That's a very uh, complicated question, <laughs> because cinema in India is as old, if not older, than it is in America. Okay. And um, you know the first silent films were shown uh, in I think the late nineteenth century in Bombay, and uh, and so it has a long uh, history and a very uh, proud history in a way, particularly in Bombay and then other regional centres. And uh, for a long time, cinema was kind of the only game in town, so to speak, it was the only uh, form of mass entertainment, mm. and so. People in India, particularly from different classes, had um, uh, uh, their own particular uh, relationship to that in a way. So, um, uh, so it has been a, a, a very important part of the media landscape in India for a long, long time. And of course, we think of Bollywood or we think of um, cinema coming out of Bombay as being um, you know, a sort of representational of all of Indian cinema. But of course, there are regional centres, and films get made. Uh, Full-length feature films get made in um, at least 17 languages a year, and then it's sort of unclear. People are unclear on how many films actually get made a year or um, receive um, a, a certificate from the censor board, the film censor board, and whatever. So, so people often think about Indian cinema in terms of full-length feature films that are um, that get a, a universal sort of um, certification which means they're um, you know able to be viewed by all audiences as that which represents Indian cinema and then they th tend to think of quote unquote Bollywood cinema or Bombay cinema as you know also the thing that is most representative of that so it is it's critical but it's been changing over time the nature of the films has changed over mm. time how people have come to think about them and write about them has changed over time. So really the field of, um, of popular Hindi film studies or commercial Hindi cinema studies um, started to emerge in the late 80s or early 90s and that's where and when the term Bollywood sort of gained real purchase. It may have been used earlier than that but that's where it gained real purchase. And so people have become, we've all become a little bit more fixated on this uh, because of its dominance in the landscape and mm. it's not as dominant today as it used to be okay. and people within uh, the commercial industry I think, not that I know um, people so well or have first-hand knowledge of this, but uh, they, they do truly believe that the films have to change to compete with um, particularly Hollywood films which increasingly uh, people watch through different media, television or mm. um, even in cinemas now. So uh, at the very time when everybody's fascinated by this concept of a Bollywood film, the thing itself has to change radically to keep pace with you know, a changing world, right. and a rapidly changing mm -hmm. world. So it is very important. And then it, Bollywood has to compete with other things like, well, first of all, television. Right. And um, a lot of content now coming from America. Mm -hmm. And then uh, something like cricket, uh, so sport, right. which is uh, huge in India. and became increasingly sort of um, more important with the establishment of IPL, the um, um, the 2020 leagues and things like that, where sort of now that that also dominates the landscape. So whatever it is, uh, these different forms of media, they have to compete for mm -hmm. people's attention and mm -hmm. time and money and all those sort of things. But um, cinema has been incredibly important because you can, just like with um, literature, you can sort of get a little bit of a sense of how people are trying to imagine their world and people who come from a particular class background. Mm -hmm. So the people who make films are clearly not, you know, they're, they're, they're from the um, higher classes in a way. And so therefore it's their imaginings of their world and what it means to be, to some degree, Indian in a contemporary mm -hmm. world and in a globalising world. So, yeah. Yeah. So, it's, it's, so it's important. Yeah. 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 Do you ever look at other forms of art, like dance or... You mentioned sport. Like, do you ever look at that while you're crafting your analysis, or do you just sport? I don't look at uh, necessarily um, for these purposes, but I do enjoy cricket. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a different. Being Australian, but, uh, <laughs> uh, despite the um, uh, some somewhat poor showing of the Australian cricket yeah. team, but um, uh, but uh, uh, and I'm, I I don't really know enough about the other art forms. Okay. So dance and music. And classical Indian music or more contemporary Indian music. I'm, I, I don't know as much about okay. those to sort of have any um, 
sense of how I would go about looking gotcha. at them, you know, in in a more holistic manner right. as, as also important parts to this um, sort of whole picture. But you're right in terms of you can't, you can, whatever you look at, you can't necessarily just take it in isolation. You have mm -hmm. to see that really it's part of a, um, a very sort of um, complex terrain where there are a lot of things that are um, vying for people's attention. Yeah, so it's it's important. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's all I have for you. Um, thank you so much for your well, time again. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you for uh, allowing me to come and talk. Yes, and, uh, of course. It's been a pleasure.